Thank you, David. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be with you, to see St. Columba's full for this ETS Day Conference. Um, so the theme of the conference, hopefully you know this by now, you've heard it a few times, you've seen it in the brochures, is the Church Among the Ruins. Thinking about the church in tumultuous times. Um, the church, when it's in an age that is surrounded by cultural instability, difficulty, where the world around the church seems to be in a state of near collapse, uh, and where we might even think about the church itself in the same kind of way, unstable, in difficulty, um, on the verge of collapse. And against that backdrop, I've been asked to speak about the church as hopeful in the face of persecution. And the way that I want to do that is um, by taking you to the Netherlands in the early 1940s. So there, I'm taking you back to World War II and to the Netherlands as an occupied country, so a country struggling under Nazi occupation. And there, I want to introduce you to one particular Dutch Reformed theologian and pastor who reflected on exactly this topic. How can the church exist in hope in the face of persecution that I think is probably unlike anything that any of us has experienced in our own lifetimes. And the theologian is a Bavink, uh, but maybe not the Bavink that you're aware of, if the name Bavink says something to you. So not Herman Bavink, um, the great um, dogmatic theologian. I'm talking about his nephew, um, Johann Herman Bavink, who I'll call J.H. Bavink from now on. Um, I, I saw people totally unrelated to, to this topic, but there was, a, there was a, a thing on Twitter, or whatever it's called now, a couple of weeks ago, where somebody asked about why there are some footballers who always get referred to by their entire names, and it was about Billy Gilmore. Nobody just calls him Gilmore. And there are theologians like that as well, and there are reasons for that. So J.H. Bavink always gets the whole name, um, whereas if you hear Bavink normally, it's just Herman. So I'm giving him the Billy Gilmore treatment. Um, he is J.H. Bavink um, for the rest of this paper. So he was, he was born in 1895, and he died in 1964. He was born as the son of a pastor in a Dutch Reformed church. He went on to study, the, um, well, to study theology under his uncle, Herman Bavink, at the Free University of Amsterdam. And then after that, he became a pastor in various congregations in different parts of the Netherlands. And he also spent two periods as a missionary in what's now Indonesia. And in one of those periods in Indonesia, he was the pastor of a Dutch expat church. So this is the context of the Dutch East Indies. So at that point, he's ministering to, to expats, um, to, to Dutch people, or to quite westernized Asians. But in his second period there, he was, he was more of a Hudson Taylor type of missionary. He took on a local name, Jai Marta Wahana. Um, he wrote books in a local language. He, he really went as native as he could in the local culture and immersed himself deeply in that local culture, in that language, and produced a very distinct kind of mission when he was there. So he, he was doing this as Jai Marta Wahana until 1933, and that's when he returned to the Netherlands to teach missiology, and then he spent the rest of his working life there in the Netherlands teaching missiology between the Free University of Amsterdam a Christian university established by Abraham Kuyper, and also at, at his church's own seminary, which, is, which at that point was in a small town called Campen. So that's 1933, comes back to Europe, and um, six years after that, in 1939, World War II breaks out. During the 1930s, the professors at his seminary had watched what was happening across the border, watched the rise of Hitler, and had spoken out strongly against him. When the war broke out, the Netherlands first declared itself neutral, but the year after that, in 1940, Rotterdam was bombed and the country came under Nazi occupation. The university where J.H. Bavink was teaching came under, uh, came, became the focus of Nazi attention because many of its professors had been openly critical of Hitler and also critical of the rise of fascism in Italy. And they were critical of theologians who sympathized with Hitler in the, the 1930s. And the same was also true of the seminary in Campen. Students and professors from both places lost their lives um, as part of the underground resistance movement. So in that context, theological education uh, became a dangerous and a clandestine 
underground activity. And the church was going through extremely perilous, troubled times. Now, to set the scene very immediately in the wider Bavinck family, in the 1940s, um, many professors from Bavinck's university were, in effect, living under house arrest. A number of these professors were, had hidden Jews in their homes. Classes were no longer being taught, and J.H. Bavinck uh, worked writing books in the basement of his house in Amsterdam. He put up thick curtains over the windows so nobody from the outside could see what was going on. He set up a bicycle generator, um, and he would have his children pedal the bike to power a light bulb next to him and his typewriter where he would write books, including this book that I'm going to be talking about today. At the same time as that, his first cousin, Reverend Kunrad Bavink, also a reformed pastor, um, was arrested for his work in the underground resistance movement. In 1942, Kunrad Bavink, uh, was, uh, he spent eight months under arrest, first in a prison in Arnhem, before he was taken to a concentration camp in Amersfoort. One of his fellow prisoners there in Amersfoort was Edith Stein. Uh, who became a, a, a really famous person in her own regard. She was a Jewish convert to Catholicism. And she described arriving in this concentration camp like this. When the vans reached the camp, they emptied their passengers who were taken over by the SS guards. These began to drive them, cursing and swearing, beating them on their backs with their truncheons into a hut where they were to pass the night without having had a meal. The hut was divided into two sections, one for men, one for women. It was separated from the main camp by a barbed wire fence. Altogether, the camp held at that moment about 300 men, women, and children. The beds were iron frames arranged in a double tier without mattresses of any kind. Our prisoners threw themselves on the bare springs trying to snatch a few minutes sleep, but few slept that night, if only because the guards kept switching the lights on and off from time to time as a precaution against attempts to escape, which was next to impossible in any case. Their cold, harsh voices filled the prisoners with anxiety about the future, and in these circumstances, it is anxiety which can turn a prison into a hell on earth. Um, Edith Stein's words about this concentration camp where Kunrad Bavink was held. Now, although Kunrad was eventually released from that concentration camp, two of his other first cousins, J.H. Bavink's other first cousins, were arrested for their work in the resistance. Their names were Hugo and Hermann Rausch. Hugo and Hermann were teenagers, and they were grandsons of Hermann Bavink. One of them was held in prison with Anne Frank, whose name I assume will be known to many of you from her diaries. And both of these boys, these brothers, were executed in 1945. And their parents were also arrested. Their mother, Hanny, who was Herman Bavink's only daughter, she was released. But their father, a lawyer called Gerrit Raus, who was J.H. Bavink's uncle, Herman Bavink's son-in-law, he was sentenced to death for helping Jews. And after that, well, his, his sentence was lessened and he was sent to a concentration camp as well. After that, he was transferred to a prisoner of war camp in Germany, Stalag XB, but he was uh, so uh, in, in such uh, bad shape, um, so gravely ill uh, through his time in the concentration camp that he actually died on the transport on the way to the, to the prisoner of war camp. So when we think about the church in the ruins, the church in a world that was descending into utter darkness and chaos, a church literally um, in the midst of bombed out cities, a church that had to go underground because of direct persecution, a church where pastors were sent to concentration camps for their faithfulness to the gospel in word and in deed. We don't have to look very far away. We just have to look across the North Sea and we only have to go back about 80 years. And there we find examples of uh, Christian hope in the writings of J.H. Bavink, written in the basement of his house while his children pedaled a bike to give him light from a single light bulb. The book that, one of the books that he wrote um, in his basement, there is this one. It's called Between the Beginning and the End. And it's a breathtaking, soaring, hope-filled picture of biblical theology 
of the story of the entire Bible as the history of redemption that is centered on the incarnation of the Son of God in this ruined world. And it's written to address people directly whose hope was all but crushed by the world that they were living in in the 1940s. Early on in the book, he writes this when he's introducing um, biblical theology to them. And the cultural backdrop to this is that the 19th century was so full of optimism about the future because of the, the rapid scientific advancements of their age. But that optimism had now been crushed by the 20th century. So he writes this at the start of the book about their culture. Yes, we can do mighty things and we can penetrate the secrets of the creation, but it really no longer makes sense because we can no longer build a harmonious world. We can never restore its disorder. War after war is destroying its existence. And this is not an abstraction. This is writing in your basement um, while you have Nazi soldiers patrolling outside. The richest cultural treasures constructed with great effort and care are reduced to rubble under the weight of the curse that threatens all human life. There is no escaping it. Whatever we do is no longer ennobled by the wonderful perspective that someday in the future, a perfect and harmonious world will be born. Our life has turned into a flight to the bomb shelters, and that is not a metaphor. We have retreated into the caves of our knowing and thinking with no other purpose than to safeguard ourselves from the calamities that threaten us from all sides. Through all this, we put on a brave front and we try almost desperately to fend off disappointment and discouragement. The, the existential need of his day was, how do I do that? How do I fend off um, disappointment and discouragement? How do you do that as a persecuted Christian in the Netherlands in the 1940s? How do you find that as a theologian writing under the cover of darkness, as someone whose cousins have been arrested, taken to concentration camps, executed? It's possible to do so. It's the argument of the book. It's possible to live a profoundly hope-filled existence and where that hope actually seems to burn all the more brightly because the darkness around it is just so dark. But to do that, you need to know that human history is full of story after story of one failed and corrupt empire, human empire after another. In between the beginning and the end, just after he writes that our lives have become a flight to the bomb shelters, he writes this. And here he's talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a terrible rival, the empire of humanity. That empire is the opposite of God's kingdom. The empire of humanity has as its most basic aim the shared desire to construct an orderly world, but a world without God, in total disregard of him. That human empire is an imitation of God's plan. It is an attempt by hook or by crook to rob God of his great plan and thus to try to make God's plan come true through human culture. Now, what, is, what does he mean by saying that this human empire tries to make God's plan come true through human culture? Well, he says that if you look at history through the lens of Scripture, you see a long story of human empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, the ancient Greeks, the Romans, and then in his own immediate time, the Nazis. And these empires are all rivals to the true kingdom of God. The kingdom of God unites people. The kingdom of God restores the, the paradise that has been lost. The kingdom of God unites people whose fellowship and harmony has been broken. It restores broken relationships between God and humans, between you and your neighbor. And it does that by uniting you under a true king, Jesus Christ. But that is the true kingdom of God. And there is a cheap, destructive imitator, the human empire, which is a cruel parody of the true kingdom of God. Bevink writes this to these Christians living under occupation. People rely on a furor or a divine emperor as a visible symbol of the invisible unity of the people or the race. People want to see themselves reflected in such a furor, want to lose themselves in their misplaced ecstasy of faith in their own greatness. 
world history is nothing but the ever-repeated attempt to build empires and the stubborn striving to rediscover humans' lost unity in such an empire. However, sooner or later, all these efforts are doomed to fail. God simply will not allow his plan to be played out by others. Now, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that for a Christian like J.H. Bavinck to sit in the literal ruins of his own culture, to look around and see circumstances so bleak that, humanly speaking, that there didn't seem to be much immediate hope for his own country and culture, for him in that, in that place, the Bible nonetheless gave him a, a bigger perspective, a much bigger history to be part of, to the point that even in those ruins, he was able to ground his life in hope. And the way that I'd like to try and introduce you to what that Christian hope looks like in the midst of persecution is it's in three points. So a free church preacher at heart, you can't shake this out of me. Um, in three points, so J.H. Bavink as a student of the ruins. Secondly, how hope works in those ruins. And then very briefly, the third and final point, the concluding point really, how hope speaks to the ruins. So first, J.H. Bavink is a student of the ruins. So at some point, um, we're not really sure when, because things had to happen very secretly uh, for people in that underground movement. Uh, probably around 1842, early, uh, sorry, 1942, or early 1943, J.H. Bavink gave a lecture to a group of theological students at their seminary in Kempen. And the topic was the future of our churches. And then it was published afterwards as a short book. The students wanted to know how he, as a theologian, um, made some sense of the world around them and his approach, and also what, what is the future of the church in the ruins? Okay, so it's so directly uh, close to what we're talking about today. They wanted to know uh, this from his view, and his approach at the start was to talk them through the kind of culture that had developed across Western Europe from the end of the First World War onwards. But before he took them on that deep dive through um, Western culture in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, he made sure that they knew that they were also part of the picture he was sketching. They were also children of these times. Um, but then he said this to them about how God uses the times to bless his children through them. He said, I am convinced that God governs the life of the world around us and that often in history, he has used all sorts of movements outside of the church to awaken new movements of reformation in his church. So although he's about to sketch out for them what he called the modern spirit that had emerged after World War I, he's, he's about to sketch the ruins. He's preparing them for something redemptive that he thought God had done even in those ruins, in that cultural movement, even from those ruins, amongst something that humans had meant for evil, God was able to bring forth something for good. The kind of ruins that he sketched were that 20th century people in those decades had given themselves over to what he called absolutism. And what he meant by this was that people increasingly struggled to value anything like a moderate opinion. Every belief had to be held with, um, abs in an absolute tone of voice, with tremendous certainty, with total definiteness. Um, no more, well, maybe, I'm not sure, no more, no more doubt, no more lack of self-assurance, no more subjectivity, no more necessary nuance, no more things that we just should be humble about, maybe because we can't know them for sure. Instead, the culture of the day um, only made room for very strong and firm beliefs. And that culture of absoluteness, he thought, had a benefit for the church, uh, it woke the church up, he thought, to the reality that the gospel, the gospel message that the church is supposed to believe is an absolute message. The gospel isn't merely good advice. It's not a moderate, wavering suggestion. It's not just some kind of hypothesis. But that good development also had a shadow side because it's just not true in the history of the church that every single doctrine needs to be held and expressed in the same absolute tone of voice. 
Uh, the point of having dogmatic theology, and as Uncle Herman Bavinck was the great dogmatician, the point of having dogmatic theology is that you know which doctrines are dogma, which you have to be dogmatic about, and there are others that you don't have to be. But the absolutist cultural climate had influenced the church also by producing theologians who were dogmatic about everything. That's this kind of sketch of the day. So absolutism. Then alongside that, he also sketched what he called negativism. So this was a cultural norm that, and we, I think this carries on very much into our own day as well. This is a cultural norm that strong opinions had to be held polemically and not peacefully. Okay, so polemically and never ironically. You couldn't just state what you believed positively on its own. You know, I believe X, full stop, end of sentence. You have to state it negatively, polemically. I believe X, and that means I despise Y. You have to know what I'm against and not just what I'm for. Okay, so this culture of negativism had become the norm. Your, your opinions had to be absolute. They had to be strong. And they also had to be locked in mortal combat with an explicitly identified enemy. Whether that enemy was a real person or not didn't really matter. That enemy had to be there. You were always either boxing or shadow boxing. Okay? But everyone had to know what you were against just as much as what you were for. And actually what he sketched out for these students is very similar to what a very important more recent philosopher, Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher, wrote about, uh, I think in the 1980s his, or early 90s, his book Sources of the Self came out. And, and there, Taylor said that for modern Western people, your sense of self, your sense of being you, actually depends on you having an enemy. You can't just be you on your own. You can't have a modern identity like that. You become who you are by demonizing someone else. Charles Taylor's argument, J.H. Bavinck got there first in the 1940s. You become who you are by demonizing someone else, and if you don't have that demonized person, your own identity just, it's like a puff of smoke, it evaporates, there's nothing there. You can only be who you are negatively, polemically. And this is still a really common trait in Western culture today. And you'll come across a lot of people, and it's far easier to find out all the things that they oppose than a very strong sense of even what they're for. This negative, negativism is still a, a very strong thing. And this was a norm in the culture that he thought also affected the church in the ruins. For you to be you in these ruins, you needed to demonize some other group, some other denomination, some other individual, some other theological tribe. It wasn't enough just to say, I am a Christian, positively, full stop, or I am reformed, positively, full stop. You also had to make sure that everyone knew what kind of Christian, what kind of reformed you were, and the specific people and groups and so on that you opposed negatively. So by this point, when he's sketching out something like a modern 20th century Western person, he's showing these students why he thought their culture had descended into another uh, unspeakably awful world war. Culture encouraged people to become extreme in their every opinion by default, and they always needed an enemy in order to be who they were. But what maybe surprises the students then is how he's able to take this and argue that even in those ruins, God did something good. But to get to that good thing, he, had, he first had to take them through another typically 20th century trait, which he calls objectivism. Okay, so absolutism, negativism, objectivism. So within three-point sermon, first point has three points as well. Okay? That's, that's symmetry. Um, so the people didn't care very much, he thought, in these decades about whatever was going on in your inner life. You know, keep the stiff upper lip, grin and bear it. Do not talk about your feelings. Nobody cares about you processing your pain, about your inner psychology, about your trauma. And actually, in this regard, Western culture now has swung to the opposite extreme. But that aspect of mid-20th century culture, he thought, was not healthy because it is out of step with the Bible itself. Because the Bible is highly attuned to your inner life, to your psychology, to the deep pain of the human being. 
And who do we see this in more than in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who is so highly attuned to the inner lives of those he met? Because his view of every person uh, had its starting point in their alienation from their creator and their lostness. How, and how could, that inner, uh, how could that inner pain not work itself out in the whole of their lives? But mid-20th century people, he thought in general terms, were much less attentive to that than Jesus was. So in this cultural sketch, his students hear that mid-20th century Westerners were absolute, they're polemical, they wanted the objective truth about things and not just some subjective psychologizing. And this was broad brush painting, to be sure. In fact, he started off the lecture by telling the students, don't think I'm talking about a particular group of people, as though I'm sketching those people to characterize their viewpoint. I'm speaking only about the modern spirit, a particular tendency that's emerging everywhere, a mentality that does indeed come to the fore in some people, but it can't just be associated with one group of people. So really, it's a picture of a zeitgeist. And it showed these students the cultural reasons for the ruins around them. And for these students, this is, it's not just a comfortable TED talk. It's not a cozy fireside discussion. 15 of their number, 15 students from this seminary, as I said, died because they joined the resistance. But Jage Baving he has a certain kind of cultural credibility in sketching these ruins for them um, because he'd spent years living outside the West and he had a different vantage point. And he also, also spoke to them about the excesses, the, the imbalances of the, the generation that he'd grown up in. It wasn't a golden age. It wasn't a paradise lost. Um, it also led to its own world war. So for these students at this point, when he's talking to them, and they've come of age in this zeitgeist that is absolutist, polemical, objective, how could God bring about something good from those ruins? So point two, how hope works in these ruins. For J.H. Bavink, because, because mid-20th century Western culture was weighted so much towards the objective and really not, a, not much towards the subjective, it actually meant that that generation rediscovered biblical theology. They rediscovered a way of reading the Bible, not just as a disconnected set of stories or books, or even as two big sets of books, old and new, that don't really have much to do with each other. Rather, they rediscovered the Bible as a history, as a history of redemption, as one great history, as one mega story made up of so many smaller stories, and where the, the small details of those stories, and we, there's an example of this from Ben's uh, lecture there, the small details of these stories are all interconnected, and they all make sense in light of each other. So let me explain what Bavink meant by this, okay? This objectivism, this objective culture, actually was something that God used to help the church rediscover a better way of reading the Bible. When, when he was talking to these students about mid-20th century Western people, he said, we live in the age that discovered world history. And what he meant by this is that as part of their fascination with the, the cold, hard, objective truth about things, people in his day became fascinated with the idea of history as something that you could think about on a huge scale, as the objective history um, of not just, you know, your, your street, or your village, or your city, or your country, but of the world, okay? So history on the biggest possible scale. And the book that made this popular in that generation was by a German writer called Oswald Spengler. So he, he wrote a book in the very, at the very end of the 19th century, German title, Der Untergang des Abendlandes. It's available in English. The English book is called The Decline of the West, but it's not a good translation of the title. The title means something like The Going Under of the Evening Land. And it's the, so it's the decline of the West in that sense. Its sun is setting. And his book had a particular argument that, uh, about world history. Okay, so not just the history of a particular place, but of the whole of the world um, viewed together. And it's the idea that the history of the world is made up of the histories of civilizations. These are the building blocks of world history. And each of those civilizations follows a predictable 2,000-year lifespan. At the beginning of that lifespan, there's a new culture that emerges, and it's vibrant, it's living, it's overcoming, overturning whatever was there before, and it, it, it wins hearts and minds. And 
then it becomes so dominant that it changes. It stops being just a culture and it becomes a civilization. It rests on its laurels because it thinks that its might will last forever. It becomes the only water that anyone can ever remember swimming in. But then it goes into a terminal irreversible decline. And 2,000 years or so after it started, it dies. And this is the inevitable process of world history. And his book tells this story uh, with the ancient Mayans, with the ancient Egyptians, with um, the, the ancient Romans, um, and then with Christianity as well. And he does this with amazing detail, arguing that you can see this pattern across the whole of world history. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating book, lots of flaws in it as well. Um, but this is something that um, people were fascinated by in the early 20th century. And it created a culture that Bavinck said saw world history and all its hiddenness and terribleness. The idea that his, the history of the world is made up of so many tiny interconnected details. And it's possible if you have a big enough perspective to see the whole thing together. And J.H. Bavinck points this out to his students, that they've read this book. But then he, he says that when that generation of Christians read Oswald Spengler, they then went further back because they weren't fully satisfied with it. And they went back and read a philosopher called Jörg Hegel, who also wrote about world history on a grand scale, but Hegel wasn't enough either. So they kept on reading further back in their own tradition and they discovered a book by a man called Augustine. And the book is The City of God. So Baving said, in recent years, Augustine's majestic book, The City of God, has been rediscovered as though it were a brand new and exceptionally relevant book. So Augustine made that generation of Christians see that they weren't really satisfied with Spengler or Hegel. And when they got to Augustine, they saw that the Bible itself is the ultimate world history. It's the ultimate history of creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And Augustine showed them that that, that world history, that in that world history, whatever place you fall in there, there within that world history, whatever human empire you live under is really just a small part of a much more epic history that we learn to see through scripture. And there we learn to see that history belongs to God. The small moment of history that you live in is part of a much bigger history that is bookended by creation and recreation. And the decisive turning point in the middle of it is when the second person of the Trinity enters that history, when the word becomes enfleshed. And when you start to see it like that, then the Bible becomes a book where the events, the details, um, either point forward to Jesus or they point forward from Jesus. But it's not a random collection of stories. Instead, it's one story, one history, progressively revealed in greater clarity and detail. It is the history of redemption. So what, what good did God bring about through that? Well, J.H. Bavink spoke to his students about the quality of preaching in their age. For that generation of preachers, there was a revival of redemptive historical biblical theology in preaching. And it worked against exemplarist preaching, you know, well, David killed his Goliath, so some giant in your life that you should go out and slay too. It, it, it killed that kind of preaching. And it also did the same for preaching that assumed the relevance of biblical characters um, to the hearer in a way that did not need to be mediated through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, preaching in that generation, he said, wanted to draw no cheap parallels between Abraham and our lives or between Paul and ourselves. So in that generation, people perceived better that you cannot preach the relevance of Abraham to someone's life without um, the mediation of the person and the work of Jesus. Now, to be sure, he also spoke to students about his generation's attentiveness um, to preaching Christ and all scripture in ways that became excessive, um, and he, he pointed his students to sermons that were too granular in preaching Christ in every micro, micro detail of biblical texts. But still he was profoundly grateful for what God had done in, in the ruins of the 20th century in this particular way. And he said this to the students, the strong interest in history that is particular to our generation and which I'm convinced comes about 
through a deep influence from scripture that runs through our Western European thinking. So this strong interest in history was used by God to awaken his church to the importance of history, but then to the importance of an entirely different kind of history, the history that he himself has bookended in his word. And he teaches us to see that history as our perspective, to see the progress in it and to understand his work better. I am convinced, he said, that in this redemptive historical perspective, we are all offered an extremely important fact, something from which we can all benefit. Now, just so you don't think that this all sounds like you know, very abstract, you know, pie-in-the-sky theologizing, remember these are the words of a man with a desperate existential need of hope, a man whose pastor first cousin is sitting in a concentration camp, a man whose aunt and uncle and cousins were uh, risking their lives every day helping Jews. He's speaking to friends who've lost, uh, speaking to students who've lost their friends, their brothers in the faith, their fellow classmates um, who've been executed. And he's telling them there that knowing how to read the Bible as the ultimate history of the world and its creation and its fall into sin in its redemption in Christ, when he says this is something from which they can all benefit, um, they are extremely powerful words. Something they can teach them how to have hope in those ruins. It's not abstract. It's the opposite of abstract. Thirdly, and briefly, um, to conclude, how hope speaks um, to within the ruins. Now, just as World War II came to a close, uh, he published this book, between the beginning and the end. If I thought ahead more, I would have coordinated with William so that there'd be some copies of this downstairs, but uh, he's assured me he, he can get these for you. He published this book, Between the Beginning and the End. And then shortly after the war, he published this book, and on and on the ages roll, which is a commentary on the book of Revelation. This book, Between the Beginning and the End, is, is a stunning book. It's his explanation of how every one of us stands both in history and also before eternity, before the face of God. And that history has a beginning and an end. And every point between the beginning and the end hinges on Christ, the king whose kingdom is opposed by human empire after human empire. And in that book, he gives a theological explanation of why those human empires are always doomed to fail. They're always doomed to go bankrupt because they trade on counterfeit currency. They're always doomed to fail because, to quote his uncle Herman Bavink, sin dies of its own diseases. Okay? It can only ever be a counterfeit and it will always fail. And at various points in the book, for his readers in the the 1940s in the Netherlands, he explains specifically why this also has to be the case of their occupiers and persecutors. So it's an example of redemptive historical hermeneutics in the Reformed tradition, um, speaking to the deep needs of the day with great power. And then in his commentary on Revelation and, and on and on the ages roll, he does something similar, but here he's exegeting the book of Revelation. And there he reminds his readers that they have just lived through another, yet another iteration of what he calls the empire of humans, this counterfeit to the kingdom of God. But that's not the only history that they are part of, okay? if they stop doom scrolling and run to Christ. They see that they're part of another history, a much bigger one. And in fact, what they have just come through is part of what John saw fall forever in Revelation. The fall of Babylon the Great, the fall of that symbolic empire that sums up the entire history of human striving against God. And that striving when it's in full flight might look so powerful and mighty, but it can only ever be temporary. It, it is the thing that will end up a ruin. And the reason that it will do so is guaranteed by the words of Jesus himself. Behold, I am making all things new. That is the word spoken to the church, the persecuted church in the ruins. 
And it's the reason that J. H. Bavinck could tell these students, wondering what their future held there in their, at that point, effectively underground seminary, um, whether they could live in hope. Behold, I am making all things new. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your kingdom, uh, your kingdom which uh, is the true thing that offers us hope, that unites us, that gathers people together from all of the world, from all across humanity, under the reign of the true King, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that that gives to churches as they live through persecution. We thank you for the examples of Christians from the past, like J.H. Bavinck um, and those in his circles who, uh, who fled to Christ and who gained hope um, even in the midst of persecution and things that we struggle to even to imagine. But we pray that you would help us to be marked by that hope, to be people of profound hope because of your son, Jesus Christ. Um, here, as we find ourselves in history, um, between the beginning and the end, and as we find ourselves standing before eternity as well. In Jesus' name, amen.